So hello everyone and welcome to the introduction to HR7 Fire. My name is Simone Heckmann. Um, I'm CEO of Gefira, a Germany-based company that offers training and consultancy for Fire. And I have myself been a trainer and consultant for Fire for uh, more than five years now. This is actually my tenth time speaking at Fire Dev Days, and I'm still nervous. <laughs> so. Let's get started. Um, first of all, I would like to talk for a little bit about HL7. If you have ever heard anyone saying something like, oh, we're not using HL7 anymore, we are using FIRE now, you can see that there's obviously a lot of misunderstanding uh, happening about what HL7 actually is, because H HL7 is often being thought about as being a standard, when in fact it is a standards developing organization or short an SDO. Uh, this organization is comprised of uh, mainly volunteers from all over the world that contribute to the development of these healthcare standards. Uh, we have working group meetings three times a year, virtually of course now, and uh, in, Besides these working group meetings, um, there's a lot of work happening through email lists with uh, collaboration tools, phone conferences. And if you would like to participate in developing healthcare standards yourself, you can easily join any of these working groups through the HL7 homepage. You can subscribe to these list serves that will put you on the email lists of a specific working group. And you can pick any working group that aligns with your personal interests. If you are specialized in uh, patient demographics, you might want to join patient administration. If you're interested in genomics, there's a working group focusing on that. So for every interest, every uh, detailed part of healthcare, you will find a working group in HL7 and you can join them at any time you like. Um, now, the reason why there's this misunderstanding of what HL7 actually means is because HL7 has been around for a very long time. The organization itself was founded in the mid 80s of the last century and it has developed multiple different standards for healthcare. And one of the most uh, successful standards is HL7 version 2. It has um, been published in the late 80s and it has been used worldwide for a very long time. In, in almost every country in the world uses that up to this day. Even today, HL7 version 2 is still the most frequently used standard for data exchange in healthcare. So this particular standard is often used called the HL7 standard. And that's omitting the fact that HL7 has produced a lot more than just version two. There's also the CDA specification out there. We have HL7 version three. And now the youngest child in that family is the new specification HL7 fire. If any one of you has not seen what HL7 version 2 looks like, this is an example for an HL7 version 2 message. It's a message-based standard um, where events uh, trigger the sending of a message. And the message could look like this. You have multiple segments in this message, with the MSH segment being the message header, it has message metadata, we have a PID segment that carries patient information, and we have, for example, a PV1 segment with information about the patient's visit in that organization. And all the information in that messages is just basically put in a sequence with uh, delimiting characters in between. And you can see that this works in many scenarios and it still works today quite well, but it's not really state of the art anymore. There, there's a lot of things that we would do differently today when communicating information. And, but the world in healthcare is still very much dominated by this approach. We have um, mostly HL7 version two based EHRs still in the hospitals and 
as this is an event-based uh, standard, uh, something occurs in that system that will trigger the sending of a message like a new patient admission or patient discharge. And then messages will be distributed to all the auxiliary systems in that hospital. That could be a lab system or radiology system, or maybe an endoscopy system. What these standards have never really touched on is the question on how this information actually gets to the end user, how a client application would give, uh, be given access to this data. And so far, all vendors have basically had their own approaches. One maybe had a da database connect and used uh, uh, SQL queries to get the information for the end user. Another vendor maybe already used a web-based approach and they would use um, for example, they would use a REST-based interface, another vendor maybe two, but they would implement it somehow differently. So um, what happens on the right side of the screen is basically all proprietary up to this day. However, there are a lot of new challenges in healthcare. Um, for example, the connection between on-premise system and cloud-based applications. We have a lot of uh, new scenarios where query driven approach is needed. Um, and in a lot of other domains, open APIs have been established as the de facto way uh, of solving these sort of communication approaches. And whenever we want to uh, ha have mobile uh, applications, there's just an expectation that data is represented, uh, for example, using the JSON format and that we have a very lightweight exchange protocol such as HTTP. Um, these three guys, uh, as the legend goes, are the inventors of FIRE and they decided that these challenges need a complete new approach to data exchange in healthcare. And the vision that they had was the idea to, instead of having a primary system, system sending out messages, to instead have an primary EHR with an open API where any application could at any time retrieve the data it needed and not only enable wearables and mobile devices to participate in this exchange, but also the web-based applications that we have or even the EHR vendor's own user application that somehow has to connect to the data in the back end. And the invention that they came up with, the, this open API for the healthcare system uh, was named FIRE. As most of you probably know by now, FIRE is the acronym for FAST Healthcare Interoperability Resources, whereas healthcare and interoperability are probably self-explanatory. And But FAST is because FIRE, uh, the, the uh, paramount aim of what FIRE is trying to achieve is to provide a framework that allows fast and low cost implementation solutions. And resources are basically the, uh, the data aspects that we are exchanging. And we will talk more about these resources anon. First, let's take a quick look at the history of HL7 FIRE. Um, FIRE started up in 20, 2011 uh, with a first draft that was published. And soon after, there was a connectathon where implementers um, uh, tried to build application using this new draft specification and offered ideas and feedback and critique on how to improve the specification. And based on that, uh, FIRE was continuously improved. And in order for the implementers to be able to not only you know, tinker around and, and build prototypes or something like that, but to be able to, you, to build actually production ready software, um, there were stable releases um, uh, over the time um, of the FIRE specification, even when it was still in under development. And these releases are called DSTUs, that's short for Draft Standard for Trial Use. Um, in uh, 2017, uh, we dropped the D from this acronym because at this point, it was no longer just a draft. It was an actual standard, um, but it still had 
the trial use behind it because uh, it was not yet finished. And having the trial use in that name allows um, the specif uh, specifiers to still make any non-compatible changes to the specification should they become necessary based on the feedback that they received from the implementers. In December 2018, finally, we had the first normative release. That's the one that's still the actual version. If you go to the fire specification page, that's the version that you will see. That's R4. In this version, however, not the, all of the standard is normative yet. It just has normative content. Um, but there's also parts of the specification that are not normative yet. So there will be more releases. R5 will be arriving in 2021, and that will be um, R6, 7, and so on after that. And in any of these releases, the uh, percentage of the normative content in the specification will become larger and larger. If you want to know more about what's on the roadmap for FHIR, what's going to be different in R5, and how the backporting of R5 to R4 is going to work, you're actually attending the wrong talk right now, because next door, Graham is speaking about just that. Uh, but please don't run away right now. Uh, all of these sessions are being recorded, so you will have enough time uh, later to, um, to see what Graham is talking about. The FIRE Manifesto is a number of um, principles that FIRE is built around, or tenets, as we say, in 2020. Um, and the first and most important of these principles is that FIRE is focusing on implementers. FIRE is supposed to be a standard that makes it as simple and as accessible for possible as possible for implementers to build products using this standard. And in a consequence, FIRE tries to remain as simple as possible. So from the start, FIRE said we are if we are specifying an 80% solution. We are specifying these elements that are used in 80% of the cases. In contrast to that, HL7 version 3 tried to be kind of the theory of everything approach to healthcare. So they tried to find a 100% solution, which eventually ended up in a a data model that was very abstract and very complex in order to cover the 100%. And so FIRE was basically going in a different direction and saying right from the start, we are focusing on these things that are the most important to everyone. Also, FIRE is focusing on reusing web-based, established web-based technologies. So for data exchange, we have in the HTTP protocol, which any implementer should know how to, how to work with that. Where in comparison with HL7 version 2, I guess most implementers probably had to Google first in order to understand what a minimal layer protocol is supposed to be looking like or how to figure out how to pass a HL7 version 2 message. Um, then we have the focus on human readable information. So whenever we have a coded structured data, we are trying to represent this also in a way that is human readable. And even the structured data part, the, the way we representate, represent the data is uh, as human readable as it possibly can be in order to facilitate debugging even for the implementers. Um, and then we have the focus on the community. As most of you would probably agree, the most important uh, resource for implementers in terms of knowledge and expertise these days is Stack Overflow. So having a community of other implementers that are stumbling over the same problems that have already found solutions to these problems is, is very important for the success of a new technology. And so FIRE is very much focused on building that community. Finally, we have the focus on scalability. In healthcare, we need a standard that supports both very simple use cases and offer simple, simple solutions for that, but it also needs to scale all the way up to be able to support really complex um, scenarios. One question that I'm very frequently asked is, now, 
what do you actually do with fire? What is fire for? And that's a very difficult question to answer because um, you can basically do everything with fire. I like to think of fire like one of these Lego boxes that offer you basic bricks and parts and things that you can use to pretty much build anything. And it's not a coincidence that when you look at the front page of the fire specification at hl7.org slash fire, the front page will offer you a representation that looks pretty much like one of these boxes where you can have all the different parts assorted um, or grouped by similarity. You will find building blocks that are very fundamental, that are used, that you just need whatever you do with fire. You have uh, building blocks um, to uh, build security and privacy around your application. You have blocks for conformance and terminology. And then we have administrative elements like patient demographics, device information or organizational data. And then we have specialized blocks um, for representation of clinical concepts, diagnostics, medications, workflow, and so on. Finally, we have a layer uh, that's called clinical reasoning that basically offers you uh, the building blocks to build any kind of secondary use that you need to build on top of this clinical information. When you go in the fire specification to the, uh, the top level tab that says resources, you will get to this page that gives you an overview of all the predefined resources in fire. Of course, we do, we do not call them bricks. Um, we call them resources because that's apparently more sophisticated, but that's bricks is basically what they are. They are the different parts that we have that we can use to build all th sorts of things that we could possibly think of. You can see that some of these resources have a little box letter N behind them. Those are the ones that are normative in the current specification. So these are stable and there are not going to be any major changes, any um, non-compatible changes whatsoever from this point onward. All the other resources have a number behind them ranging from zero, which it means that this uh, resource is basically a first draft. It hasn't been around for very long. It hasn't been uh, tested yet. All the way up to four, which would be a resource that is very close to becoming normative and very likely to be normative in the next release in R5, because it has already been widely tested and used by different companies. There has been a lot of feedback from the implementers. So there's a high confidence that this resource can go normative in, in the near future. Now, let's take a closer look at one of these resources, the patient resource, which is among those that are already normative. Um, it doesn't matter which resource you want to inspect in a specification, you will always see something that looks similar to this. You can see the different elements in that resource and, and what the name of this element is. Then in the next column in the cardinality column, you can see whether this element is mandatory or optional and whether it's repeatable or not. Um, then we have the data type column that will show you what type this element is. We have primitive data types like booleans and dates and integers, but we also have complex types like human name or address. And if you need to know what these complex types look like, you can simply click that link and you're taken to the page that will show you what the sub elements of a human name are. For example, that there are a human name consists of a given name, a family name, suffix, prefix, and so on, whereas the address has a line and a postal code and a city and a country. Um, the final column gives you a a short description of what that element is actually 
supposed to be. If that's too short for your taste and you want to have more information, you can just click the link of the element itself that will take you to a longer, uh, more extensive explanation on how to use that particular element. For those elements that are coded, uh, like the gender, for example, or the marital status of a patient, there will also be a link in the description column that will take you to the value set where you can see the different codes that are allowed to express the marital status or the, uh, the uh, gender of a patient. Now, this is an example of what an instance of a patient resource might look like. In this case, we have a XML representation. Fire, however, allows you to choose either XML as the representation format or JSON. Uh, the rule of thumb is that server-side implementations should always support both representations, whereas clients may choose which one of those they prefer. So in this case, we have an XML encoded example. And what you see in the blue box right here is what we call a narrative. It's basically an element that is common to all fire resources. That's the text element. And this element contains an HTML representation of the contents of this resource. So whenever a system for whatever reason is unable to process the structured and coded contents of a resource, it will always be able to just display the content, display the information to the end user by just using this narrative. In the yellow box, we have an example of the use of a so-called extension. As I said earlier, FHIR is an 80% solution. So we always find that FHIR does not have all the elements that you need for your specific use case. There might be country specific things that are needed or even system specific requirements, customer specific requirements. And whenever you need something in addition to what FHIR provides, you can use define and use an extension. Quite often, these extensions are defined on a national level. What we see right here is an example that has been specified Lovely. specifically for use in the US. And that's the, uh, the extension to capture a patient's race. Since that is not something that is done in many countries uh, beyond the US, it has been decided that it's not part of the 80% solution and therefore in the US, you need to use an extension for that. Um, in the green box on the bottom, you see now the parts that are part of the 80% solution. And these are the most common elements that you use to describe a patient's uh, attributes, such as name and address, a telephone number, a gender, a birth date, and so on. Now let's talk for a little bit about the different ways to exchange these resources between systems. Fire is first and foremostly seen as a web-based standard using the REST protocol for data exchange. But that's not the only way to exchange data in Fire. You can basically exchange it any way you like because there's no mandatory requirement in the specification. It's basically just suggestions on how to exchange your data. If you are using a national uh, infrastructure to exchange your data, you can use that whatever the protocol may be. As long as you are exchanging valid fire resources, that's perfectly fine. Um, and if you want to do messaging, old school messaging, like we did with version two, even that can be done using FHIR. If you want to know more about messaging, there's um, actually a session later today um, about exactly this topic. Um, nowadays, it's even socially acceptable to use FHIR in your backend storage. There are a lot of approaches where FHIR is used as uh, a persistence data structure. So even that is a pos possibility um, to use FHIR. 
But of course, REST is the most interesting part of the specification because it, it uh, offers solutions to the many challenges and problems that I described earlier, to the requirement to have a query-driven approach, to have a lightweight web-based protocol to exchange all this data. So these are REST-based exchange is the one that most vendors are actually interest, interested in. So we're going to take a closer look at that, but please keep in mind that it's not the only way to exchange fire resources. If any of you have never heard about REST or maybe heard about it, but don't have a clear idea of what this is all about, don't worry. We all have an intuitive understanding of how REST works simply because we are using it so many times every day. Whenever you open a web browser and um, open a, an HTML page, that's basically a REST interaction that's happening right there. Because what you are basically doing is you're giving the address of a resource, except that in this case, the resource is not a fire resource rep represented in JSON or XML. In this case, your resource is a web page represented in HTML. But the, the principle is very much the same. By giving the address of a resource, you are asking the server to return that resource to you, the client, and then your browser will be able to display that web page to you. So the World Wide Web is based around on the exact same principles as FHIRE. So in FHIRE, when you want to access uh, a patient resource, you're doing the exact same thing. You're giving the full URL of that resource and thereby ask the server to return that resource to you as a client. And that's what we call a read interaction. Additionally, you can, by using the HTTP headers, you can give a signal to the server whether you would like your answer to be uh, encoded in JSON or XML and the server will respond accordingly. Now, what happens more often than not is that we do not know the URL of the resource we need uh, from memory, so we have to use a search. And what happens when you type something into Google is basically that your query gets encoded into the URL and then this request is sent to, the, sent to the server and the server responds with a list of resources that match your search criteria. And again, the exact same thing is happening in FHIRE. If you don't know the URL of the patient resource you want to read, you can always use a search query by giving certain parameters, like for example, the first and the last name of your patient and the gender of your patient. And you can encode that query into a URL, send it to the server and the server will respond with um, a list of resources matching your search criteria. And again, you can choose whether you want your response to be XML or JSON encoded. Now, if you want to learn more about how to use, how to actually use that in a .NET environment or in a Java-based uh, uh, environment, if you want to build your own application allowing searches for patients or other resources, I would encourage you to join any of the Let's Build session where you will do exactly that. And you have actually have the choice of between different programming languages. Uh, I think they offer .NET, Java, JavaScript, and Swift. Um, and they will teach you how to do that using these libraries. Um, what's very important when you think about starting to use Fire, whether you build your own application or you're just getting started diving into the specification, is that, again, as I said, think about fire as a box of Lego bricks. And so if you expect that if two implementers start using fire and building something, building an app, building a server side application, whatever, um, they, would, they can just do that and end up with a completely 100% interoperable solution. That's about as likely to happen as if you give kids 
Lego boxes and ask them to build a house and expect to be given two exactly identical houses. That is never going to happen because there are too many different ways that you can use these bricks and put them together in different ways. So in order to achieve interoperability with fire, we have to make sure that everyone is using it in the same way. And the only way that we can do that is if we give not just the box of bricks and define what the bricks look like, but we also need to write uh, construction plans that give very clear step-by-step um, -step in instructions on how to achieve a specific target depending on what you want to build with fire. You need an, a construction plan that tells you how to do just that. And if two people use the same construction plan, there's a high, a very high chance that they will end up with identical solutions and therefore interoperable solutions. So finding a, a right implementation guide and using it is about the most important thing to do when you get started with FIRE. Now, implementation guides are not really a new idea. They have been around for many, many years, except that they have always been kind of an afterthought um, with this, the standards, something that happened later and mostly was published as a thick 300 pages PDF that roughly described what implementers are supposed to do. So FIRE is trying to change that and make implementation guides an actual part of the specification. So FIRE is not only giving us the framework to build things, but also a framework to build implementation guides. Implementation guides in FIRE are not just PDFs, they are actually both machine and human readable um, fire resources them themselves. And as like fire, all other fire resources, they can be searched and accessed through the RESTful fire API. And in these implementation guides, you will find everything you need to achieve syntactical and semantic interoperability for a specific use case. The most important part in these implementation guides are the so-called profiles. And profiles is a, uh, a term that you will hear a lot of talk about. What we basically mean when we talk about profiles is that we select a resource from the fire core specification that we need to build our specific use case. And then we think about how we are going to use that resource in a specific context. And one thing is that we might need to add extensions to that resource because we have specific local extra requirements that are not covered in the core specification. We may also have constraints. We may have certain elements that are required in our use case but are optional in the core specification. We might have to limit the uh, maximum cardinality of certain elements, or we might have to add certain rules that our resources need to comply to in order to be valid in our use case. And this process is called profiling. And the result of this process is a profile, which again is a fire resource and is both machine readable and human readable, and is the most important part of any implementation guide. And more implementation guides usually will have more than one profile because they use more than one fire resource. Um, but basically these implementation guides are adding the I into fire. And again, I stands for interoperability. So without using implementation guides, um, you, you're running the risk of building something with fire that might not be interoperable with many other implementations. So finding an implementation guide should always be a very important first step. And if you are not, uh, if you can find an implementation guide because you are building something with fire that no one has ever thought of before, 
you might actually be the one to write an implementation guide to, to uh, show others how you used fire to come to your solution and be able to enable others to reproduce that and create applications that are compatible to your solution. So if you're interested in how to actually do that, how to write an implementation guide in FHIR and how to build a profile, there's also a let's build session around that where you can uh, learn step-by-step step how to build a profile of a FHIR resource. Now, again, finding an implementation guide is a very important first step. So you may want to go to this page to the implementation guide registry to get an overview of one of the of some of the most important implementation guides that are out there. Um, this is a page where you can find implementation guides that have been published by national and international standards defining organizations such as HL7 itself, um, IHE International, or any of the uh, country-specific HL7 affiliate organizations. However, if you do not find uh, an implementation guide at first, there's always the opportunity to ask around in the community. And as I said earlier, the FHIR community is the most important aspect of FHIR. So you, when, when, whatever you do with FHIR, whether you're writing a new specification or using a specification, building a tool, building an app, app whatever it is you do, you should never work alone. Be becoming a part of the FHIR community is as important as downloading your Java libraries or your XML schemas. It should really be the first thing you do. Um, so I know that we do have the opportunity to chat and to build community within the Hoover app uh, throughout this event. Uh, please keep in mind that Hoover will not be there forever. Uh, it will only be active um, within the duration of this event, maybe for a few days after that. But um, for the rest of the year, um, what the community is using to keep in touch and to discuss and to answer questions and to help with problems is the international fire chat, uh, which you can find at chat.fire.org. And if you haven't signed up to that platform yet, please do so right now. That's an order. I will wait. Um, no jokes aside, it's really super important to become a part of that because this is really where the place where hundreds and thousands of developers worldwide keep in touch and discuss solutions, discuss how to for go forward with the fire specification, how to build apps, how to build tools. And um, what's really important is that when you sign up for the first time is to take a look at the different streams that you find in in this chat that you can go to by accessing, by, by uh, clicking this little gear right there, that will take you to a list of all the streams that there are. Streams are basically, you know, top level topics. And if you are from, it doesn't matter what country you are from, what language you natively speak, you will, hi you're highly likely to find a community within that community and that is from your country that speaks your language, that talks about how to uh, use fire in the scope of your specific country, or um, you will find people discussing about the Java libraries, about the .NET libraries, and about terminology. So for every topic, there is a stream in fire. So please make sure to take a good look at all the different communities that are there and to sign up for the ones that are relevant to you. And please never be afraid to ask questions in that community. That's actually what it's for. Even if it's a beginner question, even if you are looking for something and Google doesn't help, it's absolutely legitimate to ask in this community. And you will find many, many friendly people that are very much willing 
to help you out. And it can actually save you a lot of time rather than trying to find a solution yourself um, to just um, you know, contact people who maybe have the same problem and have maybe already found a solution to that problem. And also keep in mind that many of the implementation guides that you may currently be not finding are still under development. So the community is also the place where you can find uh, people working on solutions that you can actually participate in, that you can still be, become a part of creating these solutions. So again, becoming a part of the community is your primary duty as a new uh, uh, um, member of the FIRE community. And also there's a mobile app for this chat platform. It's, it's using the Sulip tool, so you can really keep in touch even with your local community um, and get push notifications for the streams that are really important to you and uh, really be involved in, in the discussions that are going on. So um, before we go to the questions, we don't have a lot of time left for questions, but I'd be happy to answer uh, maybe some of those, but don't worry, I'll be, I will stick around um, for the duration of Dev Day. So if you have a question now or maybe even later, please feel free to ask it in the Hua app. Uh, and I would check back on regular intervals and, and try to answer as many questions as you may have. Now, as you may have already figured out, um, fire is a trove of puns and word plays around the name and the pronunciation of this uh, standard. In Germany, however, we have our very own brand of fire puns because in the German, um, there's a word that is uh, pronounced exactly the same, which is the, the word fire which uh, means party or celebration. So before we start um, with the question, I would like to uh, send you off by wishing everyone Frohes Feiern, which basically translates to have a nice party. So I hope you in, enjoy Dev Days um, and I hope you are able, even though we have this virtual format, to make new friends and to really feel uh, that you are becoming a part of the community. And again, I'll be very happy to help out if you have any questions about FIRE in general or about the community or to put you in contact with uh, certain people that you feel you need to talk to. So Lillian, do we have any questions that we can answer in the last two minutes? Um, yes, I still have two questions left. Um, is it okay to exchange fire resources on custom uh, APIs? On what APIs? I didn't understand that, sorry. Custom, custom APIs. Custom APIs. Oh yes, of course, yeah. As I said, there's no requirement to use any specific uh, way of exchange. And if you want to use a RESTful approach and the HTTP protocol, but you cannot use the standard CRUD interactions, basically what REST is giving you is create, read, update, and delete on a specific resource. But not everything you need that happens between a client and a server can be broken down to any of these four interactions. So FIRE actually gives you a framework to build um, your own operations as they are called in FIRE, which is basically something like a remote function call. Like if you have a server that wants to provide a specific service to its client, that is more than just create, read, update, delete. For example, merging patients or um, uh, creating on the fly documents um, from patients information or um, different things that you need to do around uh, using terminologies, you can actually use this operation framework, which allows you to define your function, to just describe it and express um, how, to, how to use it, how to call it, what uh, parameters go in and out of that operation, and then publish that as part of your implementation guide. And if you want to learn more about that, 
um, please look at the chapter about the operations framework in the fire specification where you can learn more about how to create custom operations. Of course, as always with fire, whatever you do with these custom operations, even though you are using the fire standard to describe what your operation does, the actual operation is going to be a proprietary solution when you are the only person using it. So again, it's probably very helpful to um, describe what you are trying to achieve in the community and find more people with the same problem, with the same interest and create the specification together because the more people will use it eventually, the more interoperable it will become. Thank you. I guess that's that's it then. And uh, the questions will still be available in the Q&A. And as Simone said, she will uh, check that. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Simone. Thank you. Have a nice